schedule, uh, Dr. Blackburn and I switched places. We had a, uh, I guess he had a class or something. Uh, it worked out for me because now I have an excuse to stay for dinner and miss the late traffic. Before I go back to Long Acres Ranch, the project I'm going to share with you a little bit. So uh, first off, because we're inside, we're supposed to be outdoor lovers. We spent all day inside. Thought I'd start off here with your little dose of uh, nature prescription here. Something we're trying at this uh, new project. Yeah, if we can turn it off black for this and then um, see if any of this relates to your life here. Yeah, I've seen this. Do you find yourself vlogging for the apocalypse? <laughs> Anybody know just the wildlife impact in Texas? 
this is based on this study, state level. Again, just a number to keep in your mind, but it competes with a lot. We're talking over <laughs> $15 billion. In fact, it's related to wildland, and that doesn't count nature in the sense that this is only hunting, fishing, and looking at wild animals. It doesn't count going to the cabins, going to the mountains, going to the beaches for just those kind of outdoor experiences. The other concept or they, what does it mean to be developed? And we hear what developed is bad in this context, <laughs> but most people say that's what we need more development. I think you're right, we need more development, but we need more development of wildlife facilities. So if you look at the U.S. Fish and Wildlife at Santa Ana Refuge, quarter million people visit that quote undeveloped site, natural site in that year. So there's a demand. You're looking at $5 million, but what did they do? They didn't just develop the wildlife, they developed it to be people friendly. So there's a parking lot, there's a bathroom, and there's a, a credible staff that's managing the wildlife properly, and there's also there's trail systems, there's ways to get out there. So it's a blended process of managing for the wildlife to make it available to people. A lot of our refuges are in the very inaccessible locations. They weren't picked because they were people friendly. They were picked because they're usually for waterfowl. The other study done a few years back by ENM for the Texas Parks and Wildlife, this has just shown almost $800 million impact in the community. It's not the park itself, so the park could be losing money, but the community, and when I say losing money, that's not quite, you know, it's not perfect. So, but it shows that there's a demand is what I'm trying to say here. <coughs> um, the other thing I'll mention, and we hear this a lot, is well, we might need new housing development for our tax base in the county. But over and over again, there's been cost of government services studies that have shown, if you, these are numbers, are, these are rough, but $1.26 in expenditures from tax money for a dollar in revenue. You're losing money from a cost of go for government services, having to spend more than they generate taxes for residential zones. You're, you're making money on commercial and industrial, and you're making a lot of money on agricultural and open space as a ratio. Now the number of dollars is different, of course, but that message gets lost a lot. And even if you want this scenario, your local officials should know that that's the case. Now, I've worked with communities that they're, they're trying to encourage residents to develop and thinking they'll then have money to use on something else when they're actually losing money. When we bring this up, it has been repeated in many places. Um, so what's changing? in terms of demand and why maybe you tried something or you know people say, well, we tried it, it didn't work. Well, this beautiful quail habitat right here uh, has now been converted. You know, this is dense urban living. And so it's because we have a lot more people on the planet. In my lifetime, the population of people on the planet is more than doubled. So that means mo much more than half that land that was available then is gone. So we have a lot fewer acres of land that's in wildlife condition. We have a lot, lot fewer wildlife animals, like songbirds and others. But there's more people and we still want it. So supply and demand, people are not willing to pay a lot more or pay for things that they wouldn't in the past. So maybe a bad reason, but there's hope. You can use that and start to change that trend or reverse it in terms of, okay. What that means, though, sometimes we've got to use something in a new way. And that could be the land, it could be that old house, it could be your personal character um, in sharing something that maybe was private or looking at something that was didn't have a benefit or wasn't seen as having a benefit in the past. And, and this has happened a lot where people kind of look at a new resource, a new demand, there's new uh, social demographics. So there are opportunities that either weren't used or didn't exist even, you know, 10 years, five years ago. Things are changing. So I like this. Uh, success is not an act. There is planning. It's not tourism. Sometimes it comes as a last and they say, well, let's just do that. But it still takes work. It takes investment. And it's got to be done right and in the right place. I uh, have to make sure everyone thinks through this process. What does it take? provide people a quality experience I want to pay for. I've heard some conversations today, but a real quick example, uh, one of our uh, 
extension for the working with the landowner in West End wanted to sell quail hunts. And he's like, well, I want to get at least as much as my neighbors have. And you know, I got this old house they could use, but I want, they'll have to fix it up. And, and he's like, well, do you have good quail? So I'm like, well, yeah, well, actually, we've never really hunted. I'm not sure. And I really don't want them to come out very often. Uh, but just if they could pay me with one time, you know, it's like, okay, you're not really adding value to your guests. Okay? So if that's what you want, well, it may not work. But cultural, it's really important to blend cultural and historic things with that natural experience because that's how we live. Um, and it adds perspective on why you care about the land. That story in and of itself has value. People want to know about other people because they can relate to your passion for the land maybe more than the land itself. If they don't have that personal connection to it, well, I don't care what, what's so interesting about this pasture or that bird. Well, what's interesting is it, that you're interested in it. And as a guy that had that <laughs> experience, like the person that's kind of brought along by someone else, and they're like, ah, yeah, I'll tag along. And it's like halfway through it, like, wow, you're really into this stuff, aren't you? you know, they're, they're entertained by the fact that someone else is interested. <laughs> oh, I like this. There's a little work into it. Ted Turner, I think, has some good advice here. Uh, a little different than the rest of the things we do, maybe. A lot of work, but you gotta let people know about it and the right people, and you gotta plan your expectations appropriately. So if any of you are doing this or talking about it, the best slogan I can share is under promise and over deliver, at least a little bit. If you do the reverse, you will lose all your first time clients, especially early markets where it's word of mouth that's gonna get to them. You gotta make sure people have the proper expectations. So I want to give a few examples here throughout prairies of some things that are happening. This is a few years back, and just kind of pulled from the internet. Um, a few of these I've worked with, but not these. But looking at prairie conservation and the idea of tours and this whole idea of safari, if you've got, you know, a, a good, uh, beautiful destination where you're working on it, there is a demand for it. Uh, new tours starting up on the Great Plains. I mean, it's a big game. We've got scenery like this, if you can show this, it's uh, important if you've got quality because quality sells better than mediocre or poor, right? And a lot of our places considered natural, really, as we, as we know, are not high quality wildlife or, or landscapes. They're mediocre at best, and it's really hard to sell mediocre at a premium price. So you have to find your blend and work your way and grow into it, like you're restoring uh, I thought this was interesting, prairie chicken dance tours, throwing that word out. <laughs> uh, but it, it is, and this is out in Nebraska, and Nebraska's done some interesting things, and I have spoken in Nebraska with some of the ranchers and, and programs there, and some really interesting things being done there in the Sand Hill Country. Um, National Park Service Tallgrass Prairie and the guided tours, and I mentioned guided tours a little bit, and I won't go into a lot, but uh, there's... I think a greater need for providing professionally guided experiences than people say they want. Essentially, they don't know they want it until after they had it. Mm -hmm. If you have a poor, you know, that high school docent at the zoo walking you around in a big group when you're in your school group or whatever, that's not the same as a professionally guided experience. And there's so much benefit to these kind of things that once you've had it, you're going to look for them everywhere you travel. And it's one of the training programs we're trying to do uh, at our project and with Extension. Calamus Outfitters, this is out of uh, Nebraska also, but it's a Switzer uh, family. They actually got involved. I can't remember how it came up first, but I think World Wildlife, World Wildlife Fund offered the chance to go to South Africa and look at how they run their game uh, stations or the wildlife. And a family member went there and got pretty inspired. And they've come back and Family members, you know, kids have come back to the ranch now to live and run the guest operations, and it's supporting multi generations where the ranch wasn't doing that on its own. So, uh, here in Texas, uh, Canadian Texas, this is actually, I don't know if any of you guys knew Ken Cooley or don't know Ken Cooley. It was a wildlife specialist out there, recently retired. You got people photographing, uh, I'm not sure what it is, there might be a horned lizard in there somewhere, but. The prairie chickens are the big draw, but the fall colors in Canadian and, 
And there's, uh, if you're thinking from the community, we've got a good video that includes them and some other community success stories. But that kind of view for me was actually, I mean, um, just that wide open plain at first isn't the draw. You've got to kind of let it soak in, kind of like the ocean, and then see that there's a lot underneath and a lot going on. Uh, and again, with the, the guide or the right experience, you can become a big fan. So, um, the other thing to highlight is uh, there is value out there. Wildlife is a little quicker to see the value and what people are paying for. And if, if you ever had cost pricing uh, studies, you know, there's kind of a couple ways to do pricing. One, always know what it costs you to produce. But then there's what you really want is value-based pricing rather than commodity pricing, right? If you want people to pay for you because you have the best brand, the best story, not just because you're the cheapest price. If they buy based on price, buying the cheapest thing, that means they don't think you're any different from anyone else, and they're going to choose on price, think to yourself. But if you buy based on brand and quality, you can have something like this where <laughs> You've got a $25,000 couple day experience, which is the quality of year, but it's the brand that goes in with the King Ranch also. Because even someone else that had the same deer probably can't get that same price. Another example, Family Ranch, biggest attraction in Texas, you know, 300,000 visitors at the Natural Bridge Caverns Family mm -hmm. Ranch, but it's that one feature they developed. And the point here I make is tourism is not a per acre business like I have, right? What's your production per acre? How many ounces? You've got whatever it is, say 2,000 acre place, 35 acres, 300,000 people on that 3,500 uh, acres. The rest is just private family use. So it doesn't mean having people step on every acre. This is totally different. This is not kind of nature based, but I thought it was interesting. Uh, out near Salado, he built two buildings that uh, could hold big groups and uh, this kind of outdoor chapel and you know the location facilitates this. But he does nothing but rent the two buildings at about three thousand dollars each per weekend for weddings, mm -hmm. about four hundred thousand dollars a year in revenue. He doesn't run the weddings, doesn't do anything, has a little bachelor house, bachelor party guys come out do a hog hunt the day before on the rest of his property. Uh, it's uh, pretty good to know. <laughs> um, oh, we got that one in there again. Got to remember it. Can we go back for Okay. So, real quickly, it seems a, just a, an umbrella kind of process if you're thinking about this. I call it three eyes, but inventory what you have. And this, you probably need outside help to do this, but you can start for sure. And, and look at your natural features, things that are interesting to you or you think might be interesting to in others, and, and even if you do it on a hand-drawn map, it's good to do, but Google is good. Look at uh, what you might be able to offer in terms of tours and service. Think about when you go someplace. Is there a place to sleep, place to eat, <laughs> bathroom, travel? If it's not on your property, how close is it? Uh, what's the capacity and value of, of wildlife and wildlife restoration? There are some areas and types of wildlife habitat that could be restored or improved very quickly. And on a lot of properties, it's actually those riparian zones, really the, the areas along streams and waterways. That's your wildlife is obviously needing that. But a lot of those are not uh, managed and it wouldn't impact. They're either marginal agriculturally or they could be modified slightly so that the water benefit for livestock is still there but you get the habitat around that zone relatively easily compared to some of the big zones. Restoration can be good. Second part is interpretation, and that could be language, but what I'm talking about is what's the story of your place? What's your personal passion, your personal history with it, the history of some preacher? The, um, I mean, you can get kind of creative here, but you need to give meaning to the place, and this is what really lets people connect with it. And then integrate natural and unnatural, so, so they're called the unnatural experiences. Uh, even the same person like myself, one weekend I may want to just stop for 30 minutes and take a walk, real casual. Some other time I might go out for a week in the wilderness. It doesn't mean, you know, I want the same thing every time. And you have to decide what piece of that experience you're trying to offer, and then make sure that you understand where your visitors are, are on that spectrum. 
Okay, I'm going to end kind of this with, or come near the end, but do we have anything worthwhile? Anybody know the answer to this? Why don't polar bears eat penguins? Mm -hmm. Oh, this is a good crowd, right? You're not watching enough Coca-Cola commercials. <laughs> yeah, they live on the opposite ends of the earth, literally. But the, the point is that what's common locally can be the very thing that you should share. You know it, it's there. So if people are coming, they're going to want to know, like, which one of these is a mesquite tree? That's a, I guarantee you most people don't know. And they don't know a story behind mesquite, what it's good, why it's bad, all of that. Mesquite itself, believe, you know, and you tie barbecue to it, now you got a whole, you got a story, you got a tool, and you got something to eat. So um, don't overlook the, the common things locally. All right, I'm going to jump. You got to be unique somehow. And you've got to refine what you're doing with who you're selling it to. Um, sometimes you just have to say, no, we don't offer that. And you find the right match. So you're doing what you want, you find the people that want it, and you make that match. So you're all getting a win-win. So um, the other thing is, if you think about, if you're going to leave your normal routine and pay for a, a, a vacation or just an outing, what is it you're really getting, right? It's an experience more than a tangible product, per se. And in, in a lot of ways, you want to be able to come home and be excited and tell other people about what you did. So we're in a way we're selling bragging rights, um, in the good way. Right? So if you want to have them have an experience they're going to want to put on Facebook. So you got to think about that. And it doesn't have to be big or major. That's the way you just <laughs> fight this thing for a look. Uh, In-flight outfitters, commercial just leasing space on a ranch, uh, restoring a historical home near Goliad, uh, and uh, setting up a three-bedroom guest operation and, and wildlife uh, tours on the place, mixed in with but that history, little ag, and wildlife. Other things, tie into themes that are going on. This is the winery, the zombie town. I mean, everything's zombies now, right? It's a weird thing, right? But if you get people in the door, you give them a good time, you get them a little step, get them introduced to prayers or birds or what have you. A couple glasses of wine. Wine helps, wine helps. Um, make it easy to buy. That's one thing most in the nature don't know where do you sell the ticket or how do you sell it. You gotta have make it easy. This is just getting it out there in social networks. But what this ranch, the Sea Lambberger Ranch, uh, Johnson City, you've got things, workshops, and tours. So they do tours, but they also sell stewardship tours. Like what did we do to restore this property? So people pay for that. Other landowners are just interested people. And they have an online sales system. These are easy to get now. You can get a free contract where you just pay a commission on every sale, and it can be done with credit cards. So online sales and reservations is something to make it much easier for you and, and for your guests to buy. You can even sell coupons. And then people, don't, I know one rafting business made 60 grand a year because people would buy and never show up. That's a group wow. Yeah, so, okay, let me jump into, I'm going to skip, but uh, Yogi Bear is my favorite quote. Yeah. <laughs> you know, future ain't what it used to be. Uh, that's true. There's a lot of opportunities out there, and sometimes the crazier the idea, what makes it unique and gets you the attention and can work. Help is available through our program and extension. Some booklets and business planning tools, they're online now. Basic financial, real quick, I can help. If you work through the basics and then contact me, I can do some reality checks. I can do site visits whenever I can. It's very hard, but I can walk you through this. And then get out and experience. The best research business to be in is, is wildlife tourism. Right? Wildlife. You need to go do some research, go do something really fun to think about in terms of what you could do. I take people most every year to Costa Rica to go look at operations, both public and private. Kind of in a way that they're attracting international visitors and take ideas back. So um, we're probably going in June of 2015. But of course, if we can get 12 people together, I can just put one together on the fly.
So now, to, uh, I probably used too much of my time, but what I want to talk about is really, really exciting. This is brand new. This has been my dream for a long time. On the, if you're familiar with the AgriLife Extension, who with the idea of an experimental farm or ranch where they're testing crops and pesticides to get the best yields. And essentially, this is it for ecotourism. The ecotourism experiment station. Uh, I have a contract with a private non-profit private non foundation that owns this uh, almost 800 acre ranch. It's near Richmond, Texas, about 40 minutes from here. And we are just in the first year of setting up and managing this as a tourism attraction, but as a research facility to share with landowners and others what works, what doesn't, how you get the most money from your guests in a way that supports the conservation efforts that's going on. So this is the view outside my office, oh, wow. and uh, which is, um, there's a lot of deer in this place. Uh, there's also a lot of hogs, but we're trying to reduce them. Mm -hmm. We've got 107 so far in the last 12 months. Um, and I missed a dozen last night. But. <laughs> Goals to be a tourism attraction providing visitors nature and wildlife based experiences and to conduct the support research and education program related to best practices in ecotourism, agritourism. So we have opportunities for volunteers, for students, and for just to come visit, like I said, as part of the experiment. The activities. Now, this is an overview of the ranch. It's essentially everything inside this three-mile bend of the Brazos River. And this is Williams Way Boulevard, just two miles off of Highway 59. So we're essentially a suburban backyard mystery hole that nobody knows about with wildlife, including coyotes have called in, bobcat, and lots of deer and other things. Uh, of course, the center of the universe is College Station, as you know, so we uh, reference that. It's 90 minutes. <laughs> a few pictures from the ranch. We're doing a lot. The, the foundation for to serve the community engaged. So free Boy Scout programs, if you're involved in that, free Girl Scout camping, and 4-H uh, programs, uh, opportunities for master naturalists, everything else we're trying to charge a lot for. We've got 36 kayaks. We can do paddling trips on the river. And we have a setup for, you can do overnight multi-day trips. You can even camp on site. We're doing wildlife photography. It's going to be a major program. We just finished installing five different photography blinds and uh, going to do a specialty program for teachers and youth next, next summer. And uh, hikes and everything here will be guided slash hosted. So we're also going to be doing a youth and professional guide training program. We're trying to part-time guides and uh, hopefully full-time. I hope to be able to hire two staff people this coming year. And an event uh, definitely at least one event for the broader community as a whole in the in uh, to have people come see the place and enjoy just learn more about the outdoors which i hope to include a liars contest by the way it's a great way to <laughs> do wildlife myths and legends and then bring them up a little bit further okay uh, and the last one that says the nature prescription tours is kind of what i entered at first uh, it really kick-started for me because MD Anderson contacted us, but now Parks and Wildlife has a, a joint program. There's a lot more energy kind of on this idea of connecting outdoor activity to health. Well, of course, for the physical reasons, but there's a lot of stress relief. Mm -hmm. And actually, more and more information that might really improve cognitive ability, problem solving, just be, reduction in ADHD for kids. Like, for some kids, it's equal to, or better than medicine. It, and so basically messing around outside and picking up sticks. And, and for my theory, a lot of what we want to do is, is quote, off trail, you know? It's okay, pick something, cut something, and, and within reason, we're gonna plant it. But, but uh, we, you know, not necessarily like, st don't touch, just look. It's, it's engagement that we want to test and see how much benefit there is to it. And uh, oh, I'll just show you, this is a, uh, we got a two-bedroom house for any guest guides, researchers, folks. We got we had a Canadian university come down already. We had an Australian university come and visit with students. A lot of A&M groups, and so and we're not open yet. <laughs> but but, but y'all can come. Um, this is Mr. Jim Kidda. He's the uh, full-time employee I have. He's on there on site every day. Okay. 
We are working with our local county. If you don't know, every county has an extension office and extension staff. We don't yet have an ecotourism or, or ag tourism agent in every county, so <laughs> we'll see if that ever happens. We tied in and we started right at the end of the, of the National Park Service and the county done a master plan for recreation along the Brazos River in Fort Bend County, so there's a, a wider community effort going on. Um, this is some of the research ideas we're looking at. Really experimental design on the human experience outdoors. Doing interpretive, do we give a nice interpretive talk at the beginning for five minutes or 10? Do we do it at the end? Do we let people go off trail or not? Um, do we have, uh, if we want to target different ethnic groups, minorities, do we have a guide that's that same type of ethnic group? Do we do, we do specialty things? So we want to experiment with that and see how people react and what the price point is for those and then share those through training programs for other landowners, nonprofits, and so on. Okay. I, I clicked like three times here. There we go. So that's myself on the beach. We have like a half mile of sand beach, except for right now, it's 30 feet underwater. But <laughs> literally went from nine and a half feet on October 23rd to 40 feet on the on, what was that, about November 2nd? Mm -hmm. I think yeah. we, got, we got 10 inches of rain and 18 inches of rain. Up rain so pretty amazing. Yeah. Uh, this, real quick, I'll highlight. Everyone know what digiscoping is? <laughs> Not really. It's a, a way of taking somewhat better photos, long range with your phone or, some, or even a DSLR, than you might otherwise by putting it to the back of your binoculars or spotting scope. Oh. And there's adapters to do it, some cheap, some really high quality. <laughs> But Mr. Kidda, who's a big outdoors guy, had never seen a painted bunny in his life, and it never, didn't know what to do the was. So I said, we're going to try this because it's going to be a program. So we went out, because I know we have a lot of them on the ranch, and um, we went out, and he had the setup with the spotting scope and his little Samsung phone, and uh, we called one in, 60 seconds, he took a bunch of pictures with his phone, including getting this one. The first time you've ever seen a painted bunny and or used digiscoping. So uh, I think, and his family framed that for him. So it's kind of neat. You can give people that have been outside a lot a new experience by just focusing in on one little part of it. We do have a wildlife management plan. Um, you know, implementing it's going to be real interesting. This is the entrance. This is real dark looking, but the entrance to the facility. So I mean, you're. There's a levee here, part of the levee system, right back here, where everything inside the levee. But everyone in the community, that you don't see anything, so it's kind of this big mystery what's there. And uh, tremendous interest from the community and from groups around the state. So I think we'll just kind of, uh, it's our entrance, so you know you're there, and our bone picking eagle on the fence. <laughs> um, I'll just pop through a few photos to let you see. Scissor tail fly catchers. Just the scenery. Uh, I think you might have to do this. Okay. <laughs> Kayaking. Yeah, it's not really going somewhere. Just flip through the pictures like two seconds a piece. So part of what we'll do is where are people drawn to? Do we, you know, how do we manage, do we try to get them across the whole property? We probably will do most people in a small section. We've got a custom built people trailer, they're really hard to buy, so we have the custom built, custom built kayak trailers. Uh, now we have trail cameras up, some of which you can see online eventually. And uh, this is sunrise, it goes, yeah, we have to go, this is one of our photo blinds. This is our large, really large one sunken into the ground to get better eye level views, but this is kind of a classroom. It's 24 feet by 8 feet. It has a rainwater collection system, and we're experimenting whether it's going to work both uh, afternoon and morning by having removable panels on both sides. Um, and luckily it's sandy, so it drains really well with the rain. The others don't. Was that new or revised? No, it's custom built, custom designed, put in nothing. Like a dog kennel. Yeah. So this is the river when it's low. That's my office. That's uh, kids. Swimming with alligators. Uh, 
Who would like this, by the way? You may want to read At least two or more. Oh. Everyone know this? Oh. <laughs> yeah, well, what did this? There we go. We got a good audience here. Butcherbird. It's a, that itself, in and of itself, because they're really active along that entrance fence, and we see them regularly. There's a good um, population of them. That itself, I think, is we're going to do a test just a shrike tour because it captures so <laughs> much attention right away. Okay. Uh, I'll, I'll highlight, but yeah, Boy Scouts will have three, four hundred out tonight um, for the weekend, and, and a couple more this at Girl Scouts last weekend. Well, they didn't camp. Hopefully, they'll convert them. This is a sustainability kind of exercise using something that was on site. These old concrete culverts were on site. I say we got rid of a lot of them, but uh, eight of them. And we've got architecture students designing enclosures. We're going to put a queen size bed platform, <laughs> LED lights with rechargeable batteries, and an ice cooler air conditioning system. We're going to have eight of these shelters for kayak campers or for people to camp. Um, and uh, so something completely off the wall. That's kind of like Donald Judd, but he didn't do all that. <laughs> Four H. <laughs> Wildlife habitat and uh, just camping out. So I think this should be the last one. Well, another digiscoping picture with my phone and binoculars. So if we leave that here. I'll answer this question just to recap. This scenario now is I've been, so I'm with AgriLife Extension as a nature tourism specialist covering the state and wanted this kind of setup for a long time. And what this is is a the landowner is a private nonprofit foundation that is in the business of giving away money. Mm -hmm. And so they were looking, like any landowner, they called me for advice on what to do to have people to share with the community. And after a year and a half of working with them, they basically said, well, you should run this. And so they entered into a con they contracted me a $1.2 million contract to set up and get this going. And if everybody's happy, after six years, we'll continue on. And so that's where the base funding is coming. All of our, any revenue we would make would be right back. We need staff to do all this, and we need revenue to have that staff. So it's real in that sense, um, what's going to work and what's not. So, uh, Is question. there a nature center going in there? I had heard. Good like question. And this, is my, uh, this is my, my mission is to change everybody's definition of what the nature center is. So the nature center is already there. It's the ranch. Mm -hmm. We will have a building. <laughs> I can't help it. Uh, I didn't really want one. They've reached out to the community about, uh, yeah. they've reached out to people in the community in the past about should a nature center go here. So I'm just curious about whether that. Yeah, we've got plans to put about a two and a half million dollar building in uh, a meeting with the architect hopefully in January. And uh, the idea there is that there are some things, you know, we need to have a central point for parking and some of that basic stuff up front. But hopefully we'll have some other features and we can do photo displays and photography, we can do community meetings and, and hopefully have student groups that might come from far away stay overnight inside. Not everyone will have to camp. Um, so we'll, we'll see how that ends up. But that should start that process in January, February, I hope. So for the foundation, this is a, in essence a community service. It's a grant to you to do this, right? It's part yeah. of their Technically it's a project. contract, but it's oh. a grant. It's, a, it's their way of helping the community. Okay. Yeah. yeah. And they're doing a whole lot more. Besides the contract, they've invested already maybe 400000 in facilities, with improvements and changes. It's a it's a great it, that they it's tremendous people really interested in serving the Richmond community and uh, have I, I think I mean this is a this is a project that I just have dreamed about and I think could be so meaningful because we'll be able to do the landowner training and inspire I just gave a talk on this at our national conference and, and extension tourism and we got three states already. All suddenly, like light bulbs went on, and we like the conservation ranching idea, having models in other places. Uh, maybe we're even working with KD Perry and Warren Ranch. Uh, so, I think 
you know, it's it's an experiment. Some things won't work. Some things won't, like we heard before. Yeah, mm -hmm. but that's what we can do that a private operation might not be able to do. We can take bigger risks. We can hopefully get some of it grant supported, and so that we can test things and then share what works, so everybody else doesn't have to test them. So. Yes, that's cool. How do you um, how do you control the mosquitoes and gnats? <laughs> you I haven't trained your mosquitoes yet. I got we got it ruined <laughs> my my fall. I mean they have just been horrible, and then the the mosquitoes are as big as horses now. I mean they are just galloping in everywhere. Well, uh, um, actually, normally one of my biggest pleasant surprises is that mosquitoes are not a problem out there at all, really? except for um, a few times a year, like. Now, after we get these big rains and there's, it's still warm enough that they'll hatch out. Yeah. So there's there's quite a few mosquitoes out there right now, but it's still not. But you got three more waste out there to feed them. So yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Now, if we do some of our wetland restoration, we may have a lot more or may not. So but you might have you know, mosquito fish in it too. Yeah. 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 If we have moving water, we'll see. But basically, we haven't had a problem, uh -huh. um, and. And that can be an issue, but but essentially there's there are ways to help mitigate it, but it is outdoors. I mean, I've been there before, and it's pretty high up off the river. It's not just uh -huh. down low, so I've found that it's pretty a pretty breeze going through there a lot of yeah, the time. Breeze is help. Well, the the top upper is basically that bend, right? It's this old bend, so you have. What, what's currently all open is essentially the high, and then there's a drop, a bluff of about 10 feet, and it's kind of there. And our general plan is that we'll try to restore that upper pasture into native prairie and let the riparian zone, that lower, then become uh, riparian woodlands again, because it had been managed, you know, mow everything you could, get rid of as many trees as you could. But uh, that's, that's a general plan. So there will be different areas that have more potential for mosquitoes, in those, but also different wildlife. Mm -hmm. We have night. That's the other thing we can do is night programs, and those are tremendously popular uh, with owls. I, mm -hmm. I love owls, and so we mm -hmm. show off people owls. And uh, you know, I showed some of the first armadillo recently. You know, we had actually the head of ecotourism Ireland here a couple weeks ago, and that was the armadillo and, and a bunch of new stuff for her. And then some uh, consultant out of Canada came down. And, Showed her a barred owl. She'd never seen a barred owl before. So she actually was our first sponsor. We have a chance to sponsor Owl Rocks for 150 bucks. And she did it just like that. So actually, they're going to be named Puck and Ack. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, charging for tent, tent uh, campers, yeah. Technically, we have an open, so we have a charger. The scouts would let them camp for free. Yeah. So we probably, we're, we're kind of busy with those kind of groups. Are you letting them work. test whether or not it works? Is that why you're letting them free, or it's just the well for the youth for the scouts that'll always, always be free because mm -hmm. we want we want them to have this okay. experience. Cool. But what we'll add in is we'll add our programming interpretive elements to their experience, which right now they're just kind of insular with their own program. And however much I love the scouts, what Joe said, they don't always have leaders that are experienced yeah. in the outdoors mm -hmm. and can benefit, I think, from some more interaction. Yes. Yeah. Well, good luck with it. So come visit. Yeah. I mean, Thank you so much.